Hi guys, welcome to the Seraphine podcast. Today we're changing it up a little bit and please don't mind my voice. I lost it at the Chiefs game on Sunday and it hasn't caught back up with me. Um, but my name is Giovanna Caponetto and I'm the brand manager of the Seraphine podcast. And today we are going to get to know a little bit more about Seraphine herself and I'm super super excited about this one because she's so good at getting all of the good stuff out of everyone and, and just being so positive about everyone else and not everyone knows all of the fun things I know about you and just how wonderful of a person you really are so I can't wait for everyone to start hearing this well this is going to be interesting to have the little script flipped on me I love it I'm, I'm excited. so excited so I mean you have been doing this podcast now for what hmm I don't know. What do you what do you think, Aaron? Like four months? Four yeah. Months. Four months. Four months. And we've brought some really great people on. Um, you know, people are starting to get to know your personality um, and are absolutely loving you. They're loving the way you're interviewing people. But let's get to know you. Okay. okay? So what makes Seraphine Seraphine? Like start us from the very beginning. Like wow. Like, uh, <laughs> I mean, I I know so many stories about you. And like, yeah. every time I learn more, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> well, I, uh, I was a real, um, I was really a creative kid. Like when I, when I was younger, I was always involved in school plays, ballet. I love to dance. I love to act. I love to perform. And I think the first kind of like itches of like wanting to do like be in the public and and take it one step further was was right around fifth grade. I did this crazy <laughs> play called Tied to the Tracks. I put on a southern accent okay. at 10 years old. And it was one of those like old school um like the villain with the mustache literally tying me to the train tracks. Wait, I don't know the story. Yeah, it's it's really great. My name was Dakota Melody. Oh. And in in the actual play, um, this poor guy, his name was Andy Suhumsky. Andy Suhumsky, if you ever are listening to this, hello, my friend. You were a great, great Billy to my Dakota Melody. <laughs> um, but anyway, he had to wear girls' um, boots, like cowgirl boots. Mm -hmm. And there's this big scene where the villain is tying me to the tracks and Billy comes in to save his Dakota <laughs> Melody and he runs in and the boots slide out from this poor little 10 year old boy and he slides off the stage. And I'm like, Billy, Billy, <laughs> is Billy dead? So anyway, this is me at 10 years old. That was my first kind of like little feeling of like, oh my gosh, this is how it feels to be on stage and perform. And then I kind of took it a step further and I got it, my first like feelings of wanting to be involved in like community and politics. I ran at 10 or 11 years old <laughs> for student body president um, and I won and I did this whole campaign. There was this guy named, um, God, what is it? The guy who sings Simply Irresistible. I can't, I can't remember oh, his name. Oh, 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 oh. So anyway, it was this guy who dressed up in a suit and tie and he had these girls behind him who wore slick back hair and red lipstick and strummed guitars behind him. And I, I dressed up. I was all into my, you know, cross-dressing self. I dressed up as the guy, slicked back my hair, got my best girlfriend mm -hmm. to play the guitars with the lipstick. And my whole campaign was vote for Seraphine. She's simply irresistible. Oh, and then yes. I, I... So, I, like, why didn't you run for president this round? Oh, my God. I feel like you would have had a really good chance. Because I cry too much. <laughs> I No one wants a president that's crying. I, I swear. Because that year... <laughs> was one of the best, best and worst years of my life because I was really tased as a kid. Mm -hmm. And there was a girl, Bethany Blue. I'm seeing you, you bully. Um, she made me cry so hard. Like, they made fun <laughs> of my posters. They wrote all this crap all over it. I even think they, like, drew, like, a penis on my mouth because I had these posters. At 10 years oh, old? Yeah. There was, like, Savages. it was bad. It was, so, you know, Bop Magazine, Teen Beat? There was, like, pictures. I, I cut out one picture of the center, and I would put mine, but I had Kirk Cameron and Corey Feldman and all the weird, like, Alyssa, like, Alyssa Milano's not weird, but, like, Corey Feldman's a little weird. Um, but all around me, these 80 stars, and here I am. And those were my campaign posts, and they destroyed them. And it was the first time I ever felt that feeling. And um, the other thing is we had to do a project, and we public speaking, and I did it on Iran, my dad's background. So he's Iranian. 
And I feel like that's something not a lot of people know, realize about you. Yeah. So yeah. I'm Persian, half, half um, Persian on my dad's side. And I, I was teased so bad. They called me the Ayatollah's daughter. And oh I used gosh. to read these books about witches. And I remember they took the book and they held it up, Bethany Blue and these girls, and they were like, are you a witch? Are you a witch from the Middle East? And I remember just going from Dakota yeah, Melody. Bitch, watch out. Right? <laughs> I went from Dakota Melody, president of the class, to into sixth grade being teased to the point where I was by myself under this fucking tree on the playground. And I would just put my head in the book and I would just pray that the time would just go by at recess. And it got so bad that um, I just begged my parents. I was like, I hate, and this was in Illinois. And I was like, I want to get the fuck out of here. So we moved to Wichita and Wichita was an interesting time. Wait, so you were born in Illinois though, in right? Illinois. Okay. Yeah. So I was born, born in Illinois. Illinois. We moved to Wichita. Yep. Okay. Moved to Wichita. Wichita <clears throat> was really interesting for me. Seventh and eighth grade. Again, I really was interested in performing arts and cheerleading. My parents really weren't into that, me doing cheerleading. Um, performing arts, my mom always supported. And then when I got into high school, um, I always dated older. So I was a freshman, and my first boyfriend was a senior. And he had to come every like for three months he had to come to my house and basically earn my parents trust to finally take this 14 year old girl out and his name was Sean Fleming great great guy I mean I had so many great memories um, but it was weird it isolated me from my class right because I was so involved with upperclassmen and again didn't have a lot of like solid friends I had a couple and then I had a friend who was at another high school she's still one of my best friends to this day her name is Brandy Hallickson um, she's this gorgeous blonde who is like, she basically works for the government and is like, like I call her like the secret CIA agent. She's great. Um, but yeah, her and I really bonded over, like we dated older, but we didn't have a lot of girlfriends. Mm -hmm. So high school went on and I ended up graduating early because I was pretty lonely. I mean, I, I had one other friend who was older than me. Her name's Dawn Fountain. She has this great little thing online right now. She's the girl with the grill and she's in Wichita and she's the sweetest, sweetest I friend. <laughs> and she grills out all the time. She's uh, oldest of, a, I think a family of 10 or 12, big Catholic family. And um, if it wasn't for Brandy and if it wasn't for Dawn, um, I think I would have had a really shitty high school experience aside from the, the boys I dated. I graduated early, went to K-State and uh, was on a debate scholarship, lost that immediately because I partied too much. <laughs> I was involved in a sorority and oddly enough, I dove right into sorority life because I wanted so badly to have girlfriends and I yearned for it so much. And you know, it was, it was an interesting experience. I can't say it was perfect mm -hmm. um, because I ended up uh, deactivating my senior year, which is really weird because most people, you know, if you do things that long. But I'm one of those people that um, even if I put the time in, if I start to feel like it doesn't suit me anymore, I really don't care about getting that stamp at the end of like, oh, you completed this or whatever. I was like, you know what? It doesn't suit me anymore. I wanted to focus on different things. And college was a really great experience. I uh, Again, I got involved in theater. The, I, I loved, loved broadcast journalism. I actually was the, the host of like the news of our, like K-State had a little online news yeah. thing that nobody watched. And then I was also a radio DJ and my name was The Devious One and I did like a rap <laughs> hour. And I remember- oh, Wait, we gotta bring that back. Oh, we're fiending for more. We're gonna have like a rap hour. I'll be like, what's up, what's up? This is The <laughs> Devious One. I mean, it was hilarious because I- I Aaron's face. <laughs> it, was, it was the best thing ever. So this is a fun fact, Aaron. I was gifted by my co-host. He was this uh, this kind of half Hispanic, half black guy named Len. And Len was like, there's this album. It is so dope. And I was like, in my white girl voice, it's so dope. He's like, no, you got to be like, yo, 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 it's Seraphine. This is a dope album. And it's from, and I was like, Busta Rhymes? 
And he's like, no, Busta Rhymes. And I remember the album listening to that and just like <laughs> being completely like the, my cure. I used to love the cure and I loved uh -huh. emo music. And that's where my love of hip hop music just like, if it wasn't for, <laughs> yo, and yo, it, yo. Yo, yo. <laughs> and it was, you know what it was called? Our hour of music, the black box hour. Stop the black box. Ooh. Anyway, I don't know if that name would get get going on this day and age, but the devious <laughs> one on the black box hour and then I did my like white girl like reporting for the news station. So I did those two things, but then the acting bug hit hit me again and I kept trying to audition for all these plays and the theater people at K-State were a really clicky group and I'd audition and audition and there was a dangerous liaison um play uh, the play dangerous liaisons and I wanted so bad to be Madame Torvel and I remember there was another play by the graduates that were going on at the same time so it was main stage and little black box stage hence black box I was always in the black box um so anyway <laughs> I, I I literally inter I I wanted Madame Torvel so fucking bad and instead they were like we want you to audition for one of the the graduates plays and it was called Garbage Men of the Old West. And I was oh, like, perfect. motherfucker. <laughs> I'm like, I go from Madame Torville, this French babe, to what? Garbage, so, <laughs> garbage Men of the Old So anyway, I got, I got cast as um, a has-been uh, beauty queen from high school um, who lived in a trailer with her boyfriend and... Um, <laughs> you know, had a kid and just, you know, was living this fantasy of being something that she wasn't. And I remember um, my self-esteem was always coming into play. And, um, you know, it was always this not enough and, and, and going back to that little girl in sixth grade who got teased and in high school, you know, just feeling kind of lonely and then getting cast as this part. And I wasn't Madame Torville, but I was Sam, you know, the, the trailer park girl. <laughs> And, you know, I, I did it. And, and the funny thing is it was one of the best shows I ever, I, I, like, I ever did because it, it got me out of my comfort zone. And then my senior year, I, I auditioned. They were doing Streetcar Named Desire. And if anyone knows theater, um, Tennessee Williams' play is one of the hardest pieces to memorize because literally Blanche, the main character, is on every single page. And I had done that Southern accent back when I was 10. Uh, yeah, 10 yep. years old, Dakota Melody, now turned into Blanche Dubois. And I, I, the Persian girl got to be the Southern Belle. And um, it was so cool because we had a costume designer who was uh, had just done a portrait of a lady with Nicole Kidman. Mm -hmm. And she designed all the costumes oh. for... Um, for Streetcar Named Desire. And we did about 10 shows. And I remember it was the first time my dad ever got to see me act. And it was really tough because there was a rape scene and it's a very famous rape scene in it. And um, I just remember my father like just being a little overwhelmed like yeah. by it and just being like, I don't know what, you know, this is really great that you did this, but that's like really heavy. So my my whole life in college was great. The whole time I was, you know, waitressing at Rusty's Last Chance. And I just had a really good life in college. And when I exited out, um, I came to Kansas City because my parents moved from Wichita to Kansas City. And I was here for a couple years. And this I, was right after college. Right after college. Okay. And I thought I was going to be uh, in news. So mm -hmm. I had I accepted a job at, in Topeka, News Source 49, as a field reporter. And um, and I and honestly, I hated it because I was like knee up in pig shit because they would send me out on like the worst, you know, uh, assignments because I was new. Um, and like I'm entering, interviewing pig farmers and then there's like, uh, you know, there was like some sounds highway so thing. you. It was so awful. So I literally was like, eh, you know, I don't want to do this. I'm not getting paid that much. So then what I did was I did what most 20 year olds do is like, they go, fuck, I guess I'm going to live with my parents for a little bit, kind of figure out what I'm going to do. I managed a BB. I was a co-manager there and, um, I, I partied my ass off like my twenties in Kansas City was just about, you know, partying. And, you know, I, I felt really cool because, you know, I, I 
met like some of the cool kids, like Chiefs players and and the girls who worked at the store. You know, we all like to dress up. We like to play this image in our 20s of, you know, having figured it all out. None of us did. I mean, we were like rolling out of bed with like the makeup from last night and opening the store at BB being like, what's up? And still that actually like, sounds so BB though. Oh, like. it was, it was, but we, it was great. It was a great time, you know, in my, my past, but then I realized it wasn't enough. So I moved to Southern California and, um, it was, it was, uh, there for about eight years. And that's where, um, I started my, I, I was in real estate for a little bit, um, just because that I needed an apartment. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll rent or maybe I'll, I'll do condos. And I don't know. I just, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I needed a home. I knew I needed to live. I, I needed to make a living in Southern California. And at the time, um, you know, I, it made sense cause I'd been in sales to some degree and yeah, I got there and I hated what I did for a living. I hated it, but I loved California. And then how long were you in the real estate? I was in it for a while um, because I needed a place to live. So you like for most of the companies there, how they'll lure you in is they'll, they'll say, if you want to manage the property, um, you either can have a salary and live off site that's a little bigger, or we'll give you an apartment and you won't make as much, but you, your rent is included, you know, and, but you live on site so that every time a pager or, you know, maintenance gets a call, you get your ass up out of bed, you go to their apartment, you see their leaky faucet, or you go and get the complaint with the police because of domestic violence di dispute. Um, I worked in some interesting, um, areas mm -hmm. but then I started to go to better and better properties and I finally was just like well fuck and I ended up dating someone and he was like you know you're miserable why don't you seek out doing something else and I had always loved dance I'd always had dance in my background and I always loved fitness and I went to a pole dancing class um this is where it all goes, starts, and I fucking. love this part of your story. Um, okay, so let's time frame this. Like, when? How old were you when you started the pole dancing class? Twenty five. Oh my god, I love that. Twenty five okay. years old. So, what people don't know, what they're about to learn, is like you didn't always dance like that. You know what I mean? And then you end up being like this freaking superstar at it that we'll we'll get to here in a minute. But like, before we get into this pole dancing part of you. <laughs> you can't even say it. Like, I know, right? <laughs> well, I was about to yeah. accidentally jump ahead. But like, tell us more about the, the SoCal girl of you. Like, oh, I mean, it, you'll get to know here in a little bit that she ended up in New York, but like, don't, don't you feel like you're more of like a SoCal? Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I wish sometimes I would have flipped it. I wish I lived in New York. For those of you who ever are thinking about moving to the coast, I would say move to New York when you're younger. It takes a lot of energy to live there. Um, and Southern California, when you're trying to soften it up, there's a, actually a really famous song that was used at my graduation. It's called, I think, Wear Sunscreen. Mm -hmm. And it literally says, you know, move to New York. Uh, until it makes you go hard, then move to California until it makes you, you, you know, until you grow soft, like to experience both. And I totally, totally believe in terms of advice of life, these two entities in my life really made me who I am today. They, they played a big part. And the Southern California girl in me, I mean, I own that shit. It was, it was the early 2000s. I mean, it was bad hair extensions and low rise jeans. It was the you metallic know, bags to like Paris Hilton. Totally. <laughs> I loved it. I mean for me it was it was a a a part of my life, like you know, like the movie Dazed and Confused, mm -hmm. where it is iconic. I look at pictures, I I look at my life there. So I uh, when I was managing um, at the apartment complex, I wanted to make more money because that was the other thing about California was cars and clothes, who you were. So I it's a flashy lifestyle, totally, especially in Southern California, hundred percent. So I I knew that under the umbrella of Irvine Company. Um, that I was working, they did not want us to have a second job um, to be a manager. So I wanted, I got a job in secret and I, I drove 30 minutes um, out of the way 
and I usually work three to four nights a week. And I decided to work as a bartender. Well, first a cocktail waitress, then a bartender at Hustler. And that's the strip club, yes. I was never a stripper, let me tell you that. Not that I honestly... She pole dance, just wasn't a stripper. I, yeah, I, I have to say, I and I, I want to talk to women who are listening to this. Your 20s is about like feeling yourself and figuring out your sexuality. Right. The early 2000s was so sexual. I mean, think about Slave for You, Jenna Jameson, <laughs> like the girls next door, you know, Playboy. Like everything was on fire to be this uber sexual, like boobs and ass and tan. And California was just like turn up the dial. And I just didn't, I, I was figuring it out. I still felt like that dork in sixth grade. And um, I, I, I walked into Hustler. I wore a suit. And I remember um, this this old guy, I forget his freaking name. Um, but anyway, he looked at me, he's like, what are you doing here? Oh. And, I, and I was like, I'm here to get a job. I wanna make some money. And he's like, okay. And he's like, you know, you came to the right place. And he's like, so you just want to be, I go, well, a cocktail waitress, but I, c I can learn how to bartend. And he's like, all right. So anyway, um, he's like, well, you've gotta wear fishnets. He's like, and we either wear really short black skirts or booty shorts, and you had your hustler tank top, and um, you know you just have to understand that like you are basically a co-pilot to the dancers, and he's like, you'll learn as you go along. I'm like, what the fuck? So anyway, I I remember the first night, and we also had to wear these really big boots with high heels. My feet super were comfortable. Oh my god, destroyed. <laughs> But it was cool because, you know, you would you would develop a relationship with the dancers because the dancers essentially perform on stage to get like lap dances or private dances. Right. And as a waitress, um, along with the doormen, you're looking out for the girls because, you know, I mean, guys can get drunk and they can get handsy. And you're also, you know, in control of what they're consuming for alcohol. So anyway, um, there was one dancer. Her name was Harlow. Um, she's still a, in a, like a fr I still wish she was here because she was one of my best friends, and she was um, she she had an engineering degree and she was trying to get through school. She had long bleach blonde extensions. She went from like I think an A boob to like double D's, and she was amazing. She had the biggest smile. She was like. Britney Spears mixed with like a little bit of sassafras like she had just like she you just loved her and every time I worked with her you know I was always like I wanted to like you know be the person who's kind of looking out for her and we just became this team where you know I would I would kind of scope out who were the nice guys there and she would take them for all they were worth I mean these guys <laughs> would be like I love you so, um, yeah, it was interesting. So then she kept telling me, she's like, why don't you do it? She's like, I know you have a dance background. And every day, uh, not, not every day, every night when we would close, I would ask her to teach me a pole trick. And she would be like, girl, she's like, let's clean this pole down. You know, because, I mean, there were some interesting dancers. They weren't all Harlows. And, uh, you know, <laughs> she did, she'd be like, you know, you could be really good at this, but like, you know, I teach it to myself. And she's like, do you, do you think you'd ever do it? I go, hell no. I go, my parents would freaking disown me. So I, I said, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's a place where I can, you know, do it in private or get a poll. So anyway, I, S Factor Studios um, had opened up. Sheila Kelly is an actress in Hollywood. And I had seen one of her movies in the 90s called Singles. And um, she's this, this really interesting actress. She has... Um, like it, she comes off as very Ivy League educated. She actually has a TED talk that's amazing about women's sexuality. Um, and anyway, I went into a class in Southern California and I remember it was a classroom with no mirrors and it was all red lights and there were three poles and there was a group of 10 to 15 women that like, we just went in, we're like, what are we doing? And the lights get lower. And Did you go to this by yourself? Yeah. Well, all I love myself. that. I love that. Red lights everywhere. And then this teacher comes. She's in little booty shorts and a tank top. And she sits right in the middle. And all of her mats are circled. And she's like, welcome. And she's like, this is this is an experience you're never, you're, you're never going to forget. 
And um, I remember she turned on the music and this bass just threw down in the room. And this song by this Icelandic band, Icelandic, called yeah. Cigaro, or I think that's how you pronounce it. I always say it wrong. Um, and it's this falsetto, almost operatic voiceover bass. And she had us just start moving our body in like a breath of inhaling forward and exhaling backward and swirling our rib cage around. And she told us to close our eyes. And again, there were no mirrors and the lights were dim. And I remember trembling. Like it was like the first time I was in my body. And then we kept moving on the mats, almost like yoga Pilates-esque kind of movement with a little bit more sensual curve in your body. And then um, we, the lights came up just a bit. And then we all kind of like came out of our days. And then she taught us a little bit of a, a pole trick dance routine thing. And I just watched her move. And I watched all these girls laugh and have fun. And then I put my hand on that pole and I remember her just telling me like, take up as much space as you can. And she's like, just start to really stretch all the way out and just swing and breathe into it. And I remember that feeling and I, I wanted it again and again and again. And that's that night I decided I was gonna teach it. And it changed nearly a decade of my life. Ugh, I love this. Okay, so after this experience, um, were you dating anyone? And I was you were dating. Yeah, it was a weird thing for me because I was very scared. I was so I, I was proud, but I was like ashamed because of the pole dancing of pole dancing and the fact that I was working at Hustler because immediately there was a stigma with it. So any guy I dated, I remember there was one guy named Mike Lynch. I will always remember him. And he came it's a very in very basic name. Very. <laughs> he came in good-looking blonde guy with like, you know, like like the guys that you would like be like, "Ugh, you know, like in your 20s, like they all look like they're, you know, Wall Street guys and they came into Hustler. And I, I, he just was like, you don't belong here. Who are you? And, you know, we dated for a bit. But, like, I remember him just being like, he thought it was kind of dirty. He thought it was kind of sleazy that I worked there. And then when he found out that I was taking these classes, he's like, why are you fucking taking these classes? What are you going to be, a, a pro stripper? And, and, I, and I just remember, like, again, my, my dating life really correlated with my self-esteem. I, I didn't find a good man for a long time. I think I, I met m my first really like dear love at about age 28. And um, he was so understanding and he was so open-minded. And when he found out I wanted to be a teacher, it takes a lot for a man to understand um, women and sexuality and not it being like, a need for attention, this kind of horror, like the thing, the whore thing drives me crazy. Like if a woman wants a man's gaze on her, it's like you're desperate and you want attention. And um, in your 20s, you're at your most beautiful and sexy. Like it feels great to have men's eyes on you. But I think the hard part was... Um, the message you send and how at that time we didn't have conversations like we do now about just because I want to be sexy, it doesn't mean I, I want to have sex or that I'm, I'm, I'm a promiscuous woman. Right. So, you know, it was, it was a strange time for me, really strange. So then at what point when you were in California, were you like, I need to make that next change? Like to the next coast. Yeah, I, I, um, it was tough. It was really tough. So I um, went through. And like, why? I'm sorry. Yeah. But like, you know, you go yeah. from this sunny, beautiful place and then you're like, okay, well, it's time to go to like. Yeah, it was, it was difficult. So I had, I'd gone through a teacher training. I was teaching regularly in Southern California and I got engaged to the understanding guy. Mm -hmm. And um, our life got what I call, um, complacent like like we were good 
but we weren't really, I had this itch to do more. And California, especially Southern California, Laguna Beach is where we lived. Um, everything just felt really easy. Um, I didn't feel challenged and I, I felt limited. Like I just wanted more. Right. So we went for a vacation to visit my sister in New York. And he and I both were like, I mean, like every towering building, every <laughs> show, like we were just like. Was that the first time you had been to New York? Yeah. It was, it was the first time. And I looked at him and I go, I want to be near my sister. I want to try it out. And he looked at me and he lived in California his whole life. Not like me who'd moved a couple times. Um, and he was, he loved me. And at the time we were engaged and um, he moved for me. He moved his entire life. And we moved to New York. We lived on um, 12th Street um, right off like the river in this high rise building. It was brand new. And um, it was the hardest thing I think at that time, at that point in my life, it was one of the hardest things I ever did. And it broke our relationship. It completely destroyed it because he wasn't quite ready to live there. And I was so consumed with the city and I had not found myself. And I had kind of used him as a way, as a means to get to New York. But I didn't, I wasn't in love. I don't think I was as in love with him as I thought I was. And I knew that I, I wasn't making that much money. And in some ways, like subconsciously, I was like, well, I want to do this crazy career of a pole dancing instructor, but how am I going to live in New York? Well, I have to do it in a relationship. And it broke my heart. It broke his heart. Um, and I moved out of the apartment. I basically gave him all the furniture that I'd put on my credit card as a way of like kind of saying sorry to him. And I moved into a shithole on 75th in York in a closet that was made into a bedroom. And, um, oh my gosh. And how many square feet was that? Oh my God. It wasn't, I don't even know. It was like where you're at to that door. It was Holy literally, shit. it was little nothing. I could have fit a futon in it and it had a little closet and, um, I had a shelf with my computer as my TV and I was so poor and I had this roommate who she was so sweet, but she was dating a guy who's like, <laughs> like on the side dealing in like pot and whatever, like pot. I just said pot weed, whatever. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> do you do the weed? No, do, you do, the weed? <laughs> do you do the pot? Uh, but yeah, it was like mice infested. It was awful. And again, hit a really low self-esteem point, but I kept teaching and that's where I threw myself into S factor and I threw myself physically into everything and then I started performing and doing all this kind of crazy surf like off the beaten path things and then I was doing night cabarets with fabulous drag queens and then I had celebrities that were my clients coming in to take these classes with me and all the while every time I would be asked out to go socialize with them I was dirt poor I mean, I was like, I had one friend who she was married to a famous fashion designer and she was like, we have to buy you some clothes to go out. And I remember her taking me into one of the stores her husband owned late at night and I just cried because oh. I was so poor and I was so embarrassed and she wanted so badly for me to like my self-esteem to just get up and... I just, you know, was always based on men and not my own self-worth. So I remember she dressed me up and um, she took me out. And I was always in this environment as a teacher to preach women's empowerment and just felt like the biggest imposter because I was barely making ends meet and I lived in this shitty apartment and I was, you know, dating guys and kind of letting myself be treated like shit and all I knew was that place was like my safe haven because the women believed in me and I believed in myself for the two hours I would teach whatever class and I think that's a good testament like um you know they say that success doesn't always reflect 
money, yeah. right? And and you were so happy and you were doing such amazing things for other women yeah. at S Factor. Like that's incredible. So, I mean, I think we've all kind of gone through moments like that where, I mean, I know we talked about it in my podcast that just released yesterday. It was like, I mean, we've all been to where we're like, holy shit, like I can't even buy that drink. You know what I yeah. mean? So, it, but you have to like look back on that and be like, wait, I was successful. Yeah. Like, cause the shit you did and you're about to continue telling us, like not everyone gets to do that. No. And there are people that are like, holy shit, how did she get to that point in her life? Like, that's so cool. For one, it's successful just to even move to California. Yeah. And then it's also successful to move to New York. You could have easily, like you said to me yesterday, or not yesterday, yeah. in my podcast that released yesterday, like you said to me, you could have easily retracted home. Yeah, and, and you did oh, it. There's so many times, and you did it. Yeah, so that is a success story in itself. Like yeah. someone that can just keep pushing. So, like, with that being said, someone that you pushed so hard and so strongly, and you were so valued, was. Can we talk about her? Oh, you totally can. You totally was can. Lindsay Lohan. Yeah, right? she was. She was. Um, she was like this little flicker in my life. Um, that uh, came to S Factor. Oprah Winfrey was trying to save her in some degree of like trying to get her back on track. And um, I remember everybody in the studio was dying to work with her because, you know, I mean, whenever we had, well, and whenever we had celebrities come in, everybody was very like, oh my God, because it's exciting. You know, it's, it's, it's fun to teach them this Not language. Every day. No. Yeah. And, and you're doing something that's fun. And immediately you have to establish connection. And and she came in and she was just um, just this lovely, lovely soul that you could just tell was searching, you know, still searching. You know, I, I, I know that, you know, it, it's funny how when she came in, um, you know, she was always kind of running late and um, but she was always super apologetic. Um, we had exchanged numbers and, you know, she she was always like wanting to come into the studio later on at night in private. And um, she was just somebody who was so invested of wanting to really get involved in the movement and it wasn't just about being sexy for her she really wanted to feel the music and she really hated when the cameras came into the classroom because she felt like it was so violating and you know she she wanted like there was a lot of music laws and she wanted real music played and not like stupid music that would be like right. you know dear and you know <laughs> and uh not something like your 10 year old play and i just i i just remember just a real vulnerability. Um, I remember, you know, her talking about um, just having a connection with one of my favorite people, Jared Leto, and um, and just being so vulnerable about talking about her life, and and feeling also very like responsible of of wanting to keep her privacy and. Um, and then also being a little, you know, the thing about working with famous people is that, you know, I get it. There's so many like walls and like they can't get too close. And when they do get too close, they freak out or they have to pick up and go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that the weird part about being in somebody's life like that is that sometimes you're just there literally for a season or not even a season. For me, it was just a few weeks, but you get to I spent a lot of time in a short amount with her and um, I, I, I always will root for her no matter what. She's somebody that I just will continue to root for because I got to see such a lovely side of who she is. And I, and I think it's really sad that so many famous people um, just get crucified um, for mistakes, especially when they're young, you know? So Lindsay, it was cool working with you. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> like you said, I mean, everyone enters your life for a reason. Yeah. Everyone has a purpose. So, yeah. 
And I'm sure you were incredible to her. So, gosh, I mean, so you were in New York for how many years? About uh, almost nine, almost nine. And um, it was, you know, I moved. I was in that little shitty apartment for a while. And then my life kind of took a turn. And I lived in Brooklyn for a little bit. I lived with one of my sister's friends. My sister ran a theater um, oh, in the this East is where Village. I was about to say. And it's really cool. It's actually, it, it was in a church and it was a very, very famous theater. Um, and it was like the theater of the absurd. And theater of the absurd is like literally think the most crazy stuff. Like they would have these um, showcases of different writers and directors. And I remember like the auditioning of some of the shows. And one was like this couple that are having an argument in a car and they get into a car wreck and they you they like smat they took cheetos you know those big yeah. size cheetos and they they threw blood on themselves and <laughs> threw the cheetos and then they rolled on the cheetos what? as if it were like glass like breaking in a car wreck and you're watching it and you're like this is fucking weird but it kind of makes sense <laughs> but it's really weird and um there was there was another one where um, I didn't see this personally, but my little sister went with Sam to go um, see these different, like all these theater groups are performing yeah. all over and they're always inviting the different directors of the theater. So my sister got invited to all this stuff. And my sister saw this one show to where it was this woman who was in a kiddie pool, buck naked, and like pretending she was like birthing something. And then she was like, like dipping down and like, like, uh, using her muscles to do stuff with the water. It was so, like, I Whoa. can't even, it was really <laughs> graphic and weird. And you're like, what the frick am I watching? Some of it was really weird, but some of it is so incredible. And um, one of the gifts my sister gave to me um, was during that time of my low self-esteem, but I was kind of picking it up. I was in Brooklyn and um, she told me, she's like, I'm going to write a show. And she's like, I, um, I'd i like to to have you be cast in it. And it's called Aviary. And Aviary is where they house birds. Mm-hmm. And the story is about um, two Victorian sisters. Um, and it correlates with um, the, the Arabian night story. And the Arabian night story is about... Um, this sultan who every night he basically brings a woman to his bed and he fucks her and then he kills her. And I was one of the, I was to be the sultan's concubine that night. And um, Scheherazade was a smart son of a bitch. So what she ended up doing is after she made love with the sultan, she's like, can I tell you a story? And as he's laying in her arms and she's stroking his head, with his hair and she's having this this conversation she starts to tell him a story and every night she hits a climax in the story and she goes it's to be continued and the sultan is so curious because she's such a good storyteller that he doesn't kill her in the meantime her sister is with her as kind of her lady in waiting and her sister's every night this this like scariness of like is he going to kill her tonight is he going to kill her tonight and the play is basically this beautiful love letter to me. And I, I was getting choked up of sisters looking out for each other. And the reason why she wrote the play for me to perform in it is because she wanted me to pole dance and show my father in a very unsexy way or, or more artistic way of... My ability, the art behind it, and the fact that I... And the strength. Yeah, and like the aerial art part of it. So they had this beautiful rigging of poles and silks, and and I got to perform in front of my family, and I did it with a nod to our Persian heritage because of the Arabian night story. And um, it was the most profound and rememberable gift that a sister has ever given to me and I will always remember 
and appreciate and love her for for allowing uh, for giving me a place to to share that with my own father I absolutely love that story I mean you know I'm very close with my sister so I just absolutely love that story now I mean obviously that has to be one of the highlights of you living in New York oh it was the highlight the highlight and, and when the theater closed um so it was a it was crazy it was a black box theater so it was completely painted black and they would change it every once in a while for whatever show it yeah. was in but when it closed and there was so funny because that 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 theater actually had um like they would do fundraisers and there was mm -hmm. this beautiful garden um, that was kind of overgrown, very witchy. And they'd have like barbecues there. And every summer, you know, everyone would congregate in, in East Village to raise money for this theater. And there were so many memories there of me like coming after work to meet her there, see a show she was working on. And then obviously the aviary show. And I remember we we all had dinner at like a, a dive bar across the street and we knew it was closing and we, we like, she was like, I don't know if I can go across yet. She's like, I'm not ready. And I remember um, the, it was, the theater was open. I had the keys to it. And I remember walking in and the black box was painted all white and all the windows that had kind of been blacked out, they took off like the black off of it. And it was literally like almost a church setting and it was like sunlight and I could see the garden out there. And it was this really sad, like bittersweet goodbye because on one hand the black box like took away the beauty of the room because right. it like, you know, yeah. but in the next breath, um, there was just so much magic that had happened there. And I was just watching the sunset and I realized it would be the last time that I would ever be there. And we had had, again, I get choked up with so many like amazing memories there. And I, that's why I love ghost stories so much is I really believe our energy when you have really amazing moments, it's like an echo or a reverb from a guitar. It's like that energy is still in that room. And I swear when I die, um, if I was going to haunt anywhere, like that's one of the places I would haunt is that church because it's, it's really a magical place. So I like how that's like so the dark. You, I know you right? with your dark and light. I you're am. like if I was gonna haunt a place, it would be a be church. that fucking place. It totally would be. I'm like a, I'm I didn't so, mean to take it there I'm when you're so the poet. In your every little time. emotional place. Like, I love it. Yeah, it's such a beautiful place. I will haunt it. I will. I'm so. I mean, when it comes to gothic and romantic, the cure part of me is always gonna be there. The devious one will lighten it up a little bit, but you know, the emo Robert Smith will be like, I'm gonna haunt there for the rest of my life oh <laughs> uh, i love you <laughs> i swear but yeah yeah so new york so I, I i did we, i i stayed i guess to wrap up new york i i was i actually the, the first guy i engage, got engaged to laguna beach guy was like peace out done moved back to laguna beach i think now he's happy with a child and he has a good life in california god bless him back in guy. cali yeah and then the i was engaged a second time hence my name being the runaway bride um and he was basically kind of like risk management for like TV and film. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a movie, I think, Along Came Polly. Oh, that's like, I love that yeah, movie. Yeah. So like he's a risk manager who's yeah. like ca calculating risk yeah. or whatever. Um, so he was kind he's kind of like that guy. But anyway, um, <laughs> I met him through one of my best friends uh, at that time, Jenna Maraska, who'd won um, Survivor. Yeah. And, um, I had a really great time. That time period of my life, I moved in with him in this cute little one bedroom in meatpacking district and really great time in my life. Just lots of fun. Um, but again, there comes a time in your life to where, um, I don't know, you just, you just have to make a decision and pull the trigger. And I was 38 and I was engaged to a really, he was, I mean, on paper, this guy is everything. Like he was I mean, we had just gotten back from Paris, visited his his family who has a, a chateau in Chalon. Like everyone was like, oh my God, we, we put money down on this beautiful church that Sarah Jessica Parker and um, uh, what's his, what's uh, Ferris Bueller. I always forget, ah, what's his name? I'm going to kill myself. Oh, I don't know. His her, her husband, I'll think of it. But anyway, uh, Matthew Roderick. 
but they they got married there. And a- Alexander McQueen had his first fashion show. They're like, it was my dream venue. Oh, so it was stunning. It was stunning. And and what ended up happening is at a charity event, um, the foundation of the church literally collapsed. <laughs> And with the foundation of the church that collapsed, um, I don't know, it it was a collapse in on me. I remember just looking at my life at 38 and realizing like, okay, is this enough? Mm-hmm. Like being his wife and like being in New York doing, you know, the same stuff with the, the pole dancing and and it wasn't. And I... I walked away from it, and um, my usual thing to do is to go chase another guy, (laughs) and I did, and I chased a job and a guy to Australia, and he was perfect, I mean, he was perfect on paper, too. What was this job, though? This job, (laughs) for my love of animals, I I know. Totally different than the S Factor job. Not S Factor. It was literally (laughs) to be kind of a docent um of like a jurassic park so basically the man that i was running after into australia um, and you met him in new york i met him in new york with um all of my beautiful ladies who believed in me and was like well if this relationship doesn't work out you love animals like go to australia and go save the wombats <laughs> and um i did i i i went and i i i love the idea of of raising money for endangered animals. I was great with celebrities and 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 rich people and playing that part. Um, and then I got out to the middle of the outback and I realized, again, it was attached to him. And I realized I wasn't in love with him. And I realized I was 38. I was out in the middle of the outback. I had like literally (laughs) moved all my shit. My dog was at home with my parents and I felt so alone and so lost. And I remember putting this Facebook post about feeling fraudulent. Like I've always come off as like this independent woman. And um, yeah, I I told them that I, I, I didn't want the opportunity. I told them that I... I didn't want him <laughs> and um, really hurt him. And I hurt myself too, I think. And I remember um, panicking so badly, like all I wanted to do was go home. And I got on the plane and I had this really annoying guy next to me who I guess kept me sane because I was too annoyed to like cry too much. <laughs> and then like when he fell asleep, I bawled my eyes out as 24 hours in this like encapsulated skates with the guy being like, are you OK? What's going on? And I'm like, oh, my God, just stop putting on my headphones like I'm just going to watch another movie. I'm just going to watch another movie. And then I take the headphones. I was like, how you doing? And then I'm like, <laughs> oh, and I remember just going into the bathroom and bawling my eyes out and trying to get it together. And I landed and um, on my Facebook, I believe, or maybe it was my text message, but my now husband had reached out and he's like, hi, what are you up to? You in Australia? Where are you at? And I was just like, at that time, I just didn't know what to do because too many men, too many changes. Came home to my parents' house over Thanksgiving and he came over with two bottles of wine Johnny did and he knows the key to your heart it was <laughs> wine guys <laughs> organic wine that is the key to my heart and we did we finished the two bottles of wine and just talked and he let me tell me tell him my fucked up version of my story and and we ever since then I have not been without him so gosh I love that story yeah and he lived in New York too at one point he too, right? we lived in New York at the, the same, same time, time. And funny enough, my ex fiance and the one who is the risk manager, yeah, yeah, and he dated the same girl before <laughs> I met up with. So it was so weird. It was literally like they got the same tastes. <laughs> when you say serendipity, like that movie with John Cusack and Kate Beckinsale, if you haven't watched it, watch it for the holidays. It's one of the best movies. It's so romantic. And, um, Although I believe that you can be in love with a lot of different people, I do believe in fate. I do believe in serendipity. I do believe in that connection. And um, I 
I can't tell you. I, I am the runaway bride. I should not be with Johnny. But it's a choice, and I choose him, and I choose him every goddamn day. Well, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. And you're falling into your purpose. Yes. So we have ended up here at the Seraphine podcast. Totally. And like, I, I couldn't be more excited to be part of this journey because it's absolutely incredible. All you do is bring positivity to people. And um, I mean, so what was your inspiration behind starting this podcast? Like, I mean, I know we've just talked about all of your love for theater and performing. And I mean, this is kind of a way of, yeah. you know, outletting yeah. that. But like, what was your, what was your, your huge driver behind, I want to do this podcast of bringing the light out of darkness, you know, yeah. Seraphine. I think, um, you know, as a little girl, I always loved Barbara Walters. I even have an autograph from Barbara. Um, and I remember as a little girl being transfixed by interviews with people who had always been larger than life in my eyes. And it first started with celebrities. And I was so like, oh, my God, they have these stories I never knew. And then it changed as I got older. And I realized how my listening skills, I, I needed to hone them in because – I was so busy trying to prove to everyone that I wasn't that nerdy girl mm -hmm. that half the time they weren't doubting me and that I should just listen and, and figure out what their story was because then like that's where that connection between two people is when you start to listen and learn from yeah. each other. And um, people's stories are incredible. I mean, if you just sit and listen and I think what happened was I was, you know, having a good life with my husband I had been in I just started therapy I was learning more and more about this art of listening listening to yourself listening to others and then um I thought about what I was listening to myself how I was learning and a lot of ways that I learn is audibly um I'm like I can read books but like when I have headphones on and all I can hear is someone's voice. And um, I, I, I'm so eager. It's a good way for me to learn. Um, and then I looked at the podcast I was lis listening to. And then I thought about the people in my life. And I thought about the life I lived and how many cool people I know and how much more I wanted to know about them. And I was like, okay, I want to do this. I want to learn and I want to listen because I've, I, I feel now more than ever, I think when I went into it, it was an initial idea. Aaron and I were working on a podcast together um, for Yoga Pants Gallery. And it was so super, it wasn't, not superficial. I don't want to throw shade at it. It was just like lighthearted and eh. And I knew I wanted to dig deeper with the women that I was just meeting there. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, yeah. these girls, I would not think, have these incredible stories. And they do. And then Aaron and I, you know, just started talking. And then I, I was like, you know, COVID happened. And I was like, this might be something really cool. And then um, it got a little deeper for me because of what happened with George Floyd. Because I think I, I didn't understand I didn't understand why I why I didn't have words and how I I I was so scared of 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 confronting the side of me that cries like I just always want to like laugh at it and put it in a box and then I thought you know what fuck that that part is the activist in me that's mm -hmm. the part that is resisting what's happening and I want the people who sit in my chair across from me to have a space to where they not only can tell me about their wonderful story but they can also have a space to where if they do feel an emotion or they do have a rise in them, then maybe it stimulates something in them 
or they're already there and they want to share that energy with other people to where it's a chain reaction to where you listen to their story and all of a sudden you're like, wait a second. And I wanted this activism, philanthropy or, or raising awareness to be a part of the podcast. And then um, the final thing was um, that just hit the nail on the head of why I just want to keep doing this is my dad's diagnosis with a ALS and thinking about if my father passes away, I want his stories to be remembered. I, and I, wanna, I want an accurate like time capsule of, of, of people's stories. And I feel like m the people in my life, it's not that I owe them that. It's just, I, I feel like it's it's my it's this gift I I can give and share of my ability to listen and the ability to ask questions so that someday whether it's their child or maybe they're going out for a job or maybe they got married and their husband or their wife says what were you like back in your 20s and they can go look up this YouTube video and they can hear them tell their story at that point in time in their life because I know that when I got married to Johnny, I wanted him to understand why I made stupid decisions or, you know, who I was. And that, you know, we're not perfect and we're all learning and these beautiful moments where it is, it's encapsulated in 45 minutes of just, you just get to know someone a little better and it might inspire you to be better yourself or you just learn about them in a way you never you never saw them before and i love that and i think like you said it, it is a gift and i am not the kind of interviewer you are you are we say this every time you know someone leaves they're like holy shit you are so good at this and she is she's wonderful at segueing <laughs> to the next topic and i am not that i may be good at a lot of things but i am not good <laughs> at being a podcaster but um like this is definitely a gift that you have. And I think it's super amazing um, that you give that that platform and the opportunity for people. Because like you said, when people have the opportunity to speak about themselves um, and tell their why, like their reason of what makes them them. Um, you and I have talked about numerous times. Well, you and I, when we actually met, both of us had like this image of each other yeah preconceived notions that was not accurate yeah, on either end yeah. so I mean like when you start to when you actually listen yeah. and you get to know someone and you get to know what makes them tick and what makes them them you can tell if they're genuine or they're not and like or you can tell you you sympathize with them and you and you empathize and you and, and you connect it's that you know what it is is there's a R richard link letter it's so funny it's one of the first things i ever did that i haven't actually posted because i wanted to do, redo it richard link letter is one of my favorite directors and he has we'll interview him soon we will richard i want you on the podcast i know everything about you i literally watch every single interview he's ever done just to prepare myself and then of course i didn't post post my plea to him but i guess my point is 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 he has this movie trilogy it's called the befores before sunrise before sunset and before midnight and it's um uh, basically a, a couple Ethan Hawke, Julie Delpy, they meet each other on a train when they're young and it goes up until they're in their 40s and they end up married. And there's this beautiful line, and I always remember it, of they say God. God exists in the energy between you and another person and that ability to connect and to listen and to hear each other. And um, I, if you want to talk about um, a writer and a movie that encapsulates my heart and like kind of pushed me into this. That movie is all about conversating and getting to know someone, really knowing someone. And, you know, now at this age of 43, all I care about now is whoever I sit across from. Um, I, I want to be present. I want to connect. And, um, 
I want to have a little godlike moment with them, that energy between two and people. I absolutely think you put that off to people. And um, it, what I've noticed in the last three months, I guess, yeah. that we've worked together is, I, I know I said earlier that you're literally falling into your purpose, but in the last like three months, I've watched you just like you've watched me change but like I've watched you become so much more comfortable in who you are and not give a shit about what anyone else thinks and and I love that and um and and you've inspired me yeah to also be a little bit more like right you you don't like me (laughs) fuck off like you Um, know like I'm not asking you to like me you know what I mean and you've inspired me I'm you've inspired Aaron you've inspired Chelsea you've inspired these people around you and um the other thing I was gonna say is um you've also opened up my eyes and the people around me to like get to know them and actually listen like I said that in that podcast um that released yesterday but like there's it's very surface level with a lot of people yeah. You know, in your life and you don't realize until I honestly got around you that holy shit, like I need to know more about my friends. I need yeah. to dig in more. Like it's it's, it's why incredible. are they my friends? Yeah. And it's, what is it that they have to offer me? You know, like And what do I not know about them? Yeah. And not so I don't mean to offer me, but like yeah. offer me in like a sense of like a like their personalities yeah. and what energy do I feed off of them, you yeah. know? And it, it's the assumption part, you know, that it makes an ass out of you and me thing. Yeah. You make assumptions on people. Um, I, I did it with one of my best friends, Molly. Um, her and I always kind of going through waves of things. And her father, um, he had... I always forget if it's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. I'm so sorry, Molly, if you're listening. Um, But she experienced, you know, this happening early. And he passed away. And during that time, me and Johnny, you know, I was in my own world and new in marriage and commitment. And, you know, things had just gone upside down. and, And I she's such a tough person Mm -hmm. and she doesn't show a lot of emotion. And I assumed, I assumed because I didn't ask. Never a good thing. (laughs) And I didn't listen because I was so busy. Every time I was on the phone with her, I wanted to tell her about my life and let her know all these things um, because I'm older and wiser and figuring my crazy life out. And all the while she was in so much pain about her father And then yeah. karma has it that I find out about my dad. And I called her immediately. She's the first person I called. And I said to her, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Because just because you don't react like I do with tears and oh, the drama, and the gothicness of being in the church as a ghost, um, <laughs> doesn't mean she doesn't feel as deeply. And, um, and the same thing with my husband, my husband is a very controlled man. Like he doesn't, except when he gets mad, but like when he hurts, um, he doesn't show it as much and we can't make those assumptions. We can't, um, if we choose to connect and we choose to be better versions of ourselves. because yeah, I learn so much about my friend Molly and I learn every day about the strength of my husband just by pausing and being like, shit, I'm not listening, I'm assuming, and I'm just, you know, plowing through, like, what's the next thing? And my my piece of advice to anyone is to shut the fuck up and just listen a little longer because those are the moments when you get these beautiful, like, gold nuggets of who people are. And there's still so much more that I think, you know, our listeners need to know about you. And just kind of wanted to give them a backstory yeah. of, of who you are and what makes you you. And I mean, there's still so much more. Yeah. I don't know. Do we have time to talk about it that I want? We'll, like, we'll part to it. We'll I, part I, to I, it. Love, I want yeah. to know your fashion and yeah. spells. I want to oh, know your traveling. So like, much. Favorite places in the world. Like there are so many other things about you, but I definitely want people to know 
the backstory of you and what makes you you because just like you said like when you get to know what journey someone has been on yeah yeah it's it's knowledge and you appreciate them more and you empathize with them more you know and um and and now here you are in the middle of 2020 that's I mean been a shit show of a year oh my god and you keep getting shit piled on you know? <laughs> like I'm like your poor father you oh, know what I mean yeah. like it was like icing on the cake like in the height of all of this yeah. and now we're trying to figure out how you're going to deal with your father yeah. Yeah. and you're still pushing yeah you know what I mean you're still pushing for positivity for other people and to lift these people up and give them a platform and have this world learn about them and ask how to help them ask them what charities they're helping because that's so important to you is continuing to help people become their best self and what is it that you say to johnny every day you're like i just want want you to to be be a better better man just be a better man i love better man i always love it i love it love it love it eddie vetter you're the best i feel like um you know it's it's a it's weird because i have these moments to where you know you have this sense of responsibility and then you realize um, to fill your tank, you need you need little bits of lightness because there's a, there's a lot in the shadows that like pull you down. And um, what I love about having you and Aaron and Chelsea is this like breath of like youthful energy that reminds me of who I am. And that, you know, all these other heavy things don't necessarily define me, that they strengthen me. And, you know, and I am, I'm excited. Like, I'm excited to do a podcast about fashion and movies and, you know, food and, 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 and like uh, random, random shit about my dating life and crazy stories about Johnny and the dogs. Like I could do, there's, I think that's the beauty of, of, of this platform is that it just depends on the day. It depends on the moment. Just like when I ask people like the three people you want for dinner. I was going to ask you that (laughs) as we close this one out. Um, It just depends on the day. I think I, I'm going to constantly add, even when returning guests come, I think I'll ask it again because it is so definitive of like every day we kind of change up. Sometimes we have a heavier day and we got to put the weight of the world on our back. And other days I just want to order some velour skims and pretend I'm back it hustler in like the early 2000s, you know, (laughs) sue me for not being Mother Teresa every day. I can't, you know, my heart can't handle it. But if I was going to have the dinner, dinner guests. Yeah. And where would it be? Where would it be? And we can kind of tap into your food. but What would you be eating? Okay. So I am a bougie ass biatch. You? So no. I would um, try to rent out Versailles and the Hall of Goddamn Mirrors because <laughs> of I, would. I would be dressing fabulous. And uh, Marie Antoinette, man, let him eat cake, man. I want to have that moment. So it'd be in Versailles and um, it would be... Um, so indulgent. I, I was at one meal in my life. My friend, Steve Balderson, he's a director of film out in California. And he did this great dinner to where he literally had a menu and he had us pick from the menu, whatever we wanted. And it was crazy because it was like a really extensive menu and, um, it felt amazing. So I would kind of have an idea of who my guests were, but I would want to have a menu so they could pick whatever they wanted. Um, like a restaurant and it would definitely have a lot of bubbles, a lot of wine, a lot of berries, because that is like, if you want to know what I like, I like to throw a bunch of like raspberries and berries and blueberries and like a champagne flute. Um, And then I have to say, I love macaroons, the Marie Antoinette, my favorite dessert are macaroons and uh, uh, Christopher elbow chocolates. I love those. And then the food, could be anything. It could be sushi. Sushi. I love freaking fish. I do. I love sushi. For me, it would probably be sushi. For my guests, whatever they wanted. But the guests at that table. Um, three and they're dead or alive, right? Yeah, three dead or alive. Okay. Um, I would have to say um, today I'm going to keep it lighthearted and really th- think about who I'd actually want on my podcast. Um, 
hands down, I'm a loyalist to 30 Seconds to Mars. I'd ask Jared Leto. He could have a plus one, which would be Shannon Leto. Um, the reason why I, I he's, he's on my, my table, I guess, he touches me in so many ways. I, I love the films he chooses. I love the music he does. Um, I know most of the lyrics of the songs that he's written, and they all resonate to my heart through and through. I love the idea, the fact that he loves his mother so much that his date to most of his his shows his brother and him have been through the shit together and it reminds me a lot of me and my sister um my sisters and um i love the fact that he loves he's he's like a a, a renaissance man he he does a little bit of everything and he doesn't accept no for an answer and he keeps plowing forward and he is filled with gratitude um he is he doesn't take for granted where he's been from, from the Louisiana swamps um, to the Hollywood Hills. Then the other person I would say um, I'd love, love to, to just talk to is Drew Barrymore. That girl lived a lot of fucking life. She's got the biggest heart. She surrounds herself with good people. Um, she had a tough upbringing and she's still a fucking glowing light. I watched her uh, bring uh, Tom Green, her ex-husband, on her show. And I mean, just the sincerity and his nervousness and them seeing each other for the first time. Like, she just emulates somebody who who just roots for people. Mm -hmm. And she also is really dramatic and she gets really over the top and people will kind of roll their eyes every once in a while and be like, is that shit for fucking real? And I know through and through it's got to be sincere. I mean, she's just, uh, I don't know. From And she's she's like right around my age. E.T. is like everything to me as a kid. Um, and then I'd say the third person, it would be Robert Smith from The Cure. Um, there's my favorite lyrics he ever wrote is from Just Like Heaven. And they are with moving lips. To breathe her name, I opened up my eyes. Found myself alone, alone, alone above a raging sea that stole the only girl I loved and drowned her deep inside of me. And I was like, oh, at age 13, my life was changed <laughs> by Robert Smith with his red lipstick and his crazy emo hair. Um, he, is, um, he is the soundtrack to my life. He always will be forever and ever amen and um there's just something really special um about music and about how i can play the real on my life and there's a cure song that's always been there so those are the three for today speaking of three other things there are three more things i want to ask you before uh -huh. we close this one out yeah we've kind of been slacking on okay i love it what are three things that you're proud of yourself for this last week Oh, you're so good. So this is something Giovanna usually does with me every week. Three things I'm proud of. I think it's important, right? It is. Like I mean, she she's so always lifting others. Like I'm like, come on, let's bring it back to what we're here for. Like I mean, you're incredible. Like thank you. Let's be thank proud you. of yourself. I will take that and put it in my back pocket. Keep um, it in your front pocket. Right Keep it visible. Right? Like, I love it. Um, I would say. Um, I am proud oh, of the fact that um, put you on the spot. I'm sorry. Yeah, I that I'm celebrating. I'm celebrating any part of my life right now because there's so much sadness around me, and um, I put up. A twelve foot Christmas tree. Thank you, Rita. Um, at Rita Style. First or second. Oh, it's it's beautiful. Um, Christmas means everything to me, and um, just to have that energy to celebrate mm -hmm. is super important. The other thing I'm proud of is um, my continual dedication to therapy. Um, mental wellness is so key it's so key it, and I think so many of us like will dabble into therapy and be like I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine and in this day and age I think it's so important to be healthy 
in your mind first and foremost because it literally is like the moment you wake up, it's the first thing that triggers on. It is your decision maker of how you interact with people, of how you how you take on the day, if you say yes, if you say no, if you turn right, if you turn left, if your brain is not in a healthy place, um, you will put others at jeopardy. And I think that um, I'm so happy that I've made that a priority. And I think the third thing I'm really proud of is I'm really proud of this podcast. And I'm so proud that Aaron Graham is on my team, that you are on my team, that Chelsea is a new member. I am so proud of what we've created. And, um, and I don't take it for granted any day, any day that I have this cute little studio in my third bedroom of my house and I get to do something I love. And I, and I'm so proud that my husband, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him for being the man who he is and, and helping me find pride in myself because if it wasn't for him, um, I know women, you're like, Oh, you should have it anyway. It's not easy. You know, it, it feels good to have a team around you and a husband that remind you every day to be proud. Well, you should be. You're you're doing great. Thank and you. I love you and I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And I'm proud to be with you. And I know Aaron is too. Yes. So like I said, guys, there's still so much more that we want to have you know about Seraphine that we get to know. <laughs> we get to know that quirky side of her, the fashion side of her, the traveling side, which we're traveling soon. We are traveling wait. very soon. Um, oh. So there's still so much for you guys to learn, but we're actually not going to let you learn about it unless you like and subscribe, right? Yes. So do that <laughs> shit now. Uh, but I have to say, I know small victories as of today, which is like November 3rd or 4th, I think. What is it? We have I don't know. 85 subscribers. I know it's only, ugh, but it's 85. Yay. So like, subscribe for sure. And Giovanna, I'm going to let you close it out. <laughs> So thank you guys again for listening. Remember, I am Giovanna Caponetto from the Seraphine podcast. And this is the beautiful Seraphine Arocha. And you will see a lot more of us. So like and subscribe and we'll see you next time. See ya, see ya.